Slater Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Happy Thursday, best day of the week. Uh, I want to talk about this term, just heard it the other day for the first time, moral imperialism. But first, let's back it up. So there's two stories that pop up all the time. One is, I don't know why, but there's this attempt to normalize the eating of bugs. And you'll see it, now that I said it, you'll see these, these videos, or these uh, articles all the time about eating bugs, usually around Thanksgiving time. It's very strange. I don't understand the philosophical foundation of this argument. I think it's rooted in environmentalism, right? that eating bugs is better for the planet or something like that. But environmentalism is over for good now because of COVID. No one's ever going to believe a climate model ever again. So I don't know how much we'll see more articles about eating bugs. But anyway, uh, that's one. The second one is polyamory. Just tons of articles randomly pop up about polyamory. This is a New York Times opinion piece yesterday. Totally out of nowhere, the poly parent households are coming. Now you're thinking, oh, Slater, geez, he found one article about poly, polyamory. And all that stuff. No, no. Here's just some recent New York Times, just more of po just headlines nonstop. First try the pastrami, then the poly... Like, what are we talking... It's just polyamory headlines. There's, uh, there's something going on here. Keep flipping through, guys. Don't... <laughs> keep, keep that party going. There's something going on here. We're going to do a segment, um, I guess it'll have to be early next week sometime, about Cosmo in the 70s. Cosmopolitan magazine in the 70s and the women's rights movement and sexual revolution, feminism and all this stuff, and how they've all conjoined and all this stuff. And how Cosmo in particular was pushing people, pushing something, pushing a lifestyle on people and, and trying to move the Overton window and normalize this sexual revolution lifestyle and, and breaking traditional norms. And it's very similar. It's a very like, well, who are you to say polyamory is bad? Sure, you've never heard of it until you read this article two minutes ago, but we're going to be sure to shove it in your face as much as we can until you think it's normal or at least just another lifestyle choice. And I mean, seriously, this is what the left does, right? They open the door, they like throw out some ridiculous thing, like polyamory relationship, right? And then they start off with, well, who are you to judge? And then, well, you have to be tolerant of this. And then very quickly it goes to you must accept this. And then you must declare it is good. And if you don't agree, what are you? Some kind of bigot? That's all, that's the word. That's the, that's, that's the, the, it's even more than racist. It's a little more even like all encompassing than racist. Bigot. Conservatives are so scared to be called bigots. We don't defend the truth of anything anymore. Christians especially. There's such a fear of being called a bigot that Christians and conservatives will cower in the fetal position and say whatever needs to be said so that you don't get called a bigot by some transgender Marxist, right? You're like, support gay marriage, bigot. Support abortion, you bigot. Be an anti-racist, bigot. Vote for Kamala Harris, you bigot. You're always a bigot. And we're so scared of being called a bigot, we cave. And then the left takes that moral high ground. You have the moral high ground, but you're so scared of being called a bigot. They're like, oh, okay, you have it. And they take it. This is Darren Beatty. Uh, it's from the Claremont Institute. He was a speechwriter for Trump. I don't know when or for how long, but he was a speechwriter for Trump. Uh, I had to watch, I had to listen to this clip like 10 times before I could finally like sink in. So uh, let's try to like, I want to focus again here and, and really take in everything he says. I think it's really, I think it's true. Because the Republicans are so obsessed with proving they're not racist and racist is a term owned and controlled by the left, they will never have the moral high ground. And moral imperialism always beats individual indifference. And what I mean by that is this, put, juxtapose the slogan, silence is violence with don't tread on me. Silence is violence is morally imperialistic and it will always beat don't tread on me. And it registers the fact that the left for all its faults has the moral high ground and that's why they win. And so until Republicans can be just as confident in 
being protectors of civilization against barbarism and destruction and defend civilization as such with the same kind of moral fervor that the left attempts to tear it down with words like racism until they're prepared to do that they will lose so what is moral imperialism what does it look like last week it was weekend in dc uh well actually i think it's good so this is this i don't know what 200 people here maybe 200 protesters they're at this restaurant and they they show up and, and do this you just woke you truly believe that you love black people I ask you to raise your fist up in the air and look around you the people that have not raised their fist and ask the question why can you afford to stand in native land yeah so i missed that f word <laughs> uh and there's more swearing after that obviously but and it just goes on and on and everyone raised their hand all the white people raised their hand would you would you have raised your fist in the air? Repeat after that guy? I'm not going to talk about what they said or what they're arguing is, like we're on native land or whatever. That's not the point here. Uh, the tactic. They can do that, right? They can go to a restaurant, shut it down, shame everyone into raising their fist in the air. They can do that stunt with impunity because they are the moral imperialists. They're not punished for looting or vandalism or assault or actual crimes. They're not going to get in any trouble for stuff like that because they have the moral high ground. They act like they have the moral high ground, and, and we let them act like they have the moral high ground. They're the moral imperialists. So it's an actual term. It's not a made-up term. Uh, it's a big, in, in geopolitical spheres. Uh, it means uh, moral imperialism is the imposition of a set of moral values onto a culture that does not share those values either through force or through cultural criticism. So maybe in a geopolitical world, it'd be like, we go into Iraq and force them to have certain moral values about things, or right? So that, that, But that's what the left is doing to America today, and we let them because we don't want to be a bigot. One more clip of Darren Beatty. And having the moral high ground gives you the confidence to hold frame in a discussion. If you'll allow me, I'd like to kind of reformulate what I mean by this is a lot of yep, conservatives please. have this idea of we are the responsible adults and the left are these misguided children, but they're misguided on the basis of more or less just principles, equality and so forth. And as long as you have this idea that we're the responsible adults, but they are the irresponsible children but animated by a just moral principle again you will always lose because the moral indifference always caves to moral imperialism and moral fervor and the right not just the right really just any american who looks at what's happening is disgusted by it needs to fortify themselves with this sense of moral fervor that what's happening is wrong and not only are you just going to sit back and say it's wrong but you are going to defend against it with the same kind of conviction the same kind of fervor the same kind of aggressiveness and even imperialism that the left uses to destroy everything that is just and beautiful and elevated Moral indifference always caves to moral imperialism and moral fervor.
So I'll give an example of this in action from yesterday. Love, whenever you speak about these truths, I don't have to go searching back <laughs> like, to find examples. Just, oh, here's one from yesterday. Uh, is a state senator, California state senator from San Francisco. His name is Scott Weiner. <laughs> and this law that will pass in California would change uh, sex, um, uh, like sex registration laws. So when this law passes, if a teenager, sex offender registration, uh, if a teenager between 14 and 17 has sex with an adult who's 10 years older or less, so if a 14-year-old has sex with a 24-year-old or a 17 with a 27-year-old, then the adult is not automatically going to be on the sex offender list. So the headline in the Chronicle is amazing. See how they put this? Bill aims to fix sex offender lists in equity toward gay men. This is an equality issue. He's just fighting for equality. That's all. Don't you like equality? Are you against this? What are you, some sort of bigot or something? Oh, you're a homophobe. <sighs> wow. He literally, the Wiener, Senator Wiener, he literally said, uh, this is horrific homophobia. You're a homophobe. You're a bigot. You have to support this in the name of equality. That's a moral imperialist. That's an imposition of a set of moral values onto a culture that does not share those values. And everyone caves. We don't want to be a big one. Uh, the mathematician we had on yesterday from Princeton, Sergu, uh, the piece he wrote in Quillette, he ended it with, he said, above all, we have to stop being frightened, intimidated, and afraid to fight back. And I was, I mean, it's not literally, we're not like fighting with fists. Let's just start with not caving at the mere risk of being called a bigot for saying polyamory's bad and 24-year-old men shouldn't have sex with 14-year-old boys. Can we start there? Can we have the moral courage to start there? Because if you don't, who's going to take the high ground? True story, Mike Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, I like it every once in a while when the, the left drops their mask for a minute, and that's what this uh, teacher did here. First of all, I don't know why, like, it's pretty clear. It's like, it's near child abuse to drop your kid off at a public school. I know that sounds dramatic, but why would you do that? Why would you send your place, why would you send your kids to that place? It's like, the, the analogy we give is, if you want to send your kid to a baseball camp, so you, you send them there, and then they, at this camp, they teach that baseball's stupid and racist and we should all practice ballet instead. Like, why would you drop your kids off at a place where they teach that our founding was based off of slavery? The Revolutionary War was fought to protect slavery, and two plus two doesn't always equal four. Like, what, like, like why, why would you? Oh, by the way, pop, I mean, we did a segment on that last week. Popular Mechanics wrote a nice clickbait article. Why some people think two plus two equals five, and why they're right. It's from Popular Mechanics. So, um, this is it, by the way. So let me, mm, we got some great guests coming up. Let me make this statement here. This isn't a bit of an aside. I, my kids are younger, they're like five months, two and three, but I would do everything, anything to keep my kids from a public school. I'd move, quit a job, live in a trailer, whatever it takes. The most important thing is, is first how you raise your kids in the word of God and then their education. The size of my house can't possibly be as important as my kids' education, but you can prioritize your life however you want. Anyway, this is Matt Kay. Uh, he's a teacher at the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia, which is a magnet school. He wrote a book about how to have meaningful race conversations in the classroom, and he wrote this on Twitter. He since deleted it and made his whole account private. Um, let me read it quick. So this fall, virtual classes will be held with many potential spectators, parents, siblings, etc., in the same room. Room, we'll never be sure who's overhearing the discourse. What does this mean for our inclusion, inclusion and equity work? Uh, how much have students depended on the somewhat secure barriers of our physical classrooms to encourage vulnerability? Next one. While conservatives about race in uh, conversations about race are in my wheelhouse, uh, I am most intrigued by the damage that helicopter snowplow parents can do in honest conversations about gender and sexuality. Last one. And while conservative parents are my chief concern, 
I know that the damage can come from the left too. If we are engaged in the messy work of destabilizing a kid's racism or homophobia or transphobia, phobia, how much do we want their parent, their classmates' parents piling on? Okay, it's so good, right? Like I don't, the point, I don't want parents listening to what I have to tell my students. That's what that is. Uh, you may remember this. This is an MSNBC promo from 2013. I just want to make the point that this was written out. She did many takes. There were edits signed off by producers, like ran its way up the network, and then ran as a promo many, many times. Like this was not a slip of the tongue. Uh, here's Melissa Harris Perry here. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Great. Not great. Uh, it's beautiful. She was at Princeton for a while. I don't know where she is now. Um, so they got to get rid of the private. There's a private idea of the family. So to Marx, right? The the two things that were most in the way of a Marxist revolution was the church and the family. And the Soviet Union in particular, every effort was take was was taken to take ownership uh, of children. And feminists have since taken over that goal. The goal of feminism is to get women out of the house and into the workforce where you can achieve your true value as a person. And if you want to control a population, if you want to break down, let me put it like this, if you want to control a population, you break down the family. If you want to break down the family, you pressure women to leave the home, which is what feminism has done. I know so many women who have just worked, 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 worked their entire like, early adulthood law school, med school, dead up to their eyeballs. And then they have kids, and they don't want to work anymore. But there's this huge societal pressure to get back in the workforce. And they don't want to. They want to be with their kid. And they don't know what to do. Because there's huge pressure. You have to work, you have to work. What do you mean you have to work? And then there's like this sunk cost of, well, I'm about $200,000 in debt from law school, I have to pay it. Like, that's the plan, was to do this, and now I don't want to do this anymore, and it's hard to make that pivot. And then we've also, we built this standard of living expectation in America around a two-income household. So like, well, I gotta go back, because we have to afford this giant house and all these things that I buy all the time, so I have, I have to leave, we have to leave my kids in daycare, right? That's a whole different conversation, too, we'll get back to that. But there's this idea from progressives that, you know, we need this village. And they've taken this concept of the village, which is definitely true, but what they've done is they've removed the dad from the village with welfare, and they've removed the mom from the village with feminism. And all that's left is the state. That's it. And Gavin Newsom is your village elder. Right? Joe Biden is your village, your village elder. I have a village. My village is my, my nuclear family, and then our extended family, and then our neighbors, and then our community, and most importantly, our church. That's my village. Notice I'm here. My wife's here. We're all here. Gavin Newsom and Joe Biden have nothing to do with the village. But the left's version of the village is all centered around the state. This is uh, Rich Lowry. Uh, he said, as the ultimate private institution, the family is a stubborn obstacle to the great collective effort. And so far as people invest in their own families, they are holding out on the state and unacceptably privileging their own kids over the children of others. These parents are selfish, small-minded, and backwards, they say. That's the root of it. The family is the single greatest source of inequality to children. If two adults get married, stay married, invest in their children, and I, I don't even mean money necessarily, just invest time, that child will be way better off than coming from the broken family or the family that may be attacked but doesn't invest that time and love and culture of learning and discipline and all these other things. That creates huge inequalities. My kids are going to have a huge leg up over most other kids because my wife and I work really hard to produce that level of inequality and I don't feel bad about it. And you shouldn't feel bad about it either. It reminds me of the, the, the uh, articles that were written last week or so about these learning pods 
right, that, that families are starting where, because there's no school, so they're creating like these co-ops and they're getting a couple families together and they're meeting in the backyard and they're taking turns and all this stuff. And I, clearly that's, that's always, always been done and that's clearly what people should be doing. And there are all these articles in the New York Times about how that's just going to make inequality even worse and you shouldn't do that. But, like, uh, screw you. Of course, of course I'm going to do whatever it takes to educate my kids and you're not going to shame me about that. Nice try, but you're not going to shame me about wanting what's best for my kids. Lowry said, uh, the family is so essential to the well-being of children that it has to be a constant source of frustration to the egalitarian status, a reminder of the limits of his power. It's a good line. So with COVID, we're going to go one of two ways here with education. We're either going to embrace I don't even know if you want to call it school choice. I know Rand Paul has this plan, and uh, Trump mentioned it yesterday, where you just give 10, 15 grand, whatever it is per student where you are, to the parent per kid. So he's like, oh, here, here's, here's 15 grand for one kid, here's another. You got two kids in school, here's 30 grand. You can do whatever you want with it when it comes to school. You can do a private school, you can go to the public school if you want. You can do a co op, you can do tutors, you can do homeschooling, you can do whatever you want. It's your, your money to, to do what you want with when it comes to your kid's education. Like, that's brilliant. Of course, we need to do that. Or we're going to decide that this is the time to end all school choice options completely. Get rid of all the charter schools, make private schools illegal, and get rid of all the home school, right? So it's no longer, right? Because we got to get rid of that because we don't want inequality, right? We got to get rid of all inequality. Got to make everyone equal. That's the noble thing to do. Oh, you're against that? You're a bigot. So we're going to move in one, I don't know if we're going to move like ultimately to one of those two places, but we're going to move in one of those two directions. That's for sure. Which one? I don't know. I hope we move more in the direction of freedom. Maybe this next election will have something to do with that. Uh, coming up next, we have a congressman who wrote this uh, really interesting book about the artwork all around D.C., which is cool. And then we're going to talk with Ali Beth Stuckley, who, who wrote another great book uh, about uh, all these self-help books that are out there and how they're like way, way off base. So two great authors coming up next. True story, Mike Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders. So I just finished this book. It's called David's Sling. It's by Dr. Victoria Coates, who's an art history major at the University of Pennsylvania and was Ted Cruz's national security advisor. <laughs> it's like bizarre. But anyway, she takes 10 different pieces of art throughout history and talks about the story of democracy around each of them. Super fascinating. Great read. Definitely recommend it. Well, one of our congressmen has a, a similar book. Uh, congressman Ken Buck from Colorado. The book is Capital of Freedom, Restoring America's Greatness. Congressman, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, thank you. I love how you not only talk about the principles we are built on, uh, but you take us through the Capitol building to tell that story. Uh, why? <laughs> why do you tell this story of America through art? Well, I, I, I give tours of the Capitol in the evening and uh, just uh, love the, the, the history in the Capitol. I've gone with various historians, David Barton from Texas, the house historian, the architect of the Capitol, uh, many others to learn about the features of the Capitol as well as uh, some of the stories that occurred in the Capitol. And, and uh, when I think about uh, progressives that walk by these symbols of freedom, and then vote the way they vote and act the way they vote. And then when I look at the cancel culture that's going on now in this country and how they want to ignore history, ignore the very things that we walk by every day on our way to votes, it just, it stuns me. And I wanted to write a book and, and let people know that uh, if they come to the Capitol, it's a really cool art museum in addition to uh, where we uh, conduct legislative business. Yeah, it has, you would think it would change you walking through those halls every day. You'd think it'd change you for the better, right? Well, it, it would certainly uh, inspire you to seek freedom and inspire you to, to uh, recognize the great sacrifice that our founders and others have made in this country's history to give us those freedoms. And it really doesn't. So many people just ignore it and, and walk by um, and don't even look and pay attention. Or like AOC just sees a, a white guy, imperialist colonizer. Um, tell us about the rotunda itself just the architecture of it. Why is that important? 
Well, the rotunda is really uh, fascinating because uh, below the rotunda is the crypt, and the crypt is where George Washington was supposed to be buried. His wife, uh, he actually in his will, he wanted to be buried in, in Mount Vernon, and his wife uh, agreed that, that he would be buried in Mount Vernon. So, but, but under the crypt is the, uh, or I'm sorry, under the rotunda is the crypt. And that is the center point of Washington, D.C. And, and the, the city that's named after George Washington, uh, he was supposed to be buried in the, in the center point. Above the crypt is the rotunda. And when you look into the dome of the rotunda, you can see the spirit of George Washington being carried to heaven by the angels. And then we hear constantly about separation of church and state. Uh, all of these magnificent symbols of uh, uh, our, our religious heritage exist in in the United States Capitol. There's a, a painting of, of uh, you know, a baptism uh, that, that occurs. Um, there's, there's just all these uh, great uh, things that you can look at. And then all of a sudden people are walking through the rotunda to votes and, and they start talking about separation of church and state. The chapel is located right off of the uh, rotunda, the house chapel. Uh, you go in there and you see this uh, stained glass window of, of George Washington on a knee praying, uh, looking up above to heaven. Uh, just uh, unbelievable symbolism in, in our capital. Yeah. Tell us about, uh, you just mentioned Washington, and, and actually David Sling talks about Trumbull's painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware. What does that painting mean to you? Oh, it's it's uh, it's great. Um, the, the the George Washington crossing the Delaware uh, to me has everything to do with uh, the inspiration of this country and and the hardship that uh, so many went through. I mean, we have people that uh, don't have uh, shoes in the den of a really harsh winter that are fighting for this country, and that was one of the turning points of of the Revolutionary War, the war that gave us uh, our freedom. But there's another great painting in in the rotunda of George Washington, and it's a painting of him resigning his commission. And Mm. uh, in Europe, it just stunned the European leaders that someone that had fought a war would actually give up power. When they fight a war and win, they want to grab more power. And, And it was just unbelievable to most people. In fact, Mike Lee, uh, in the forward to this book, Capital of Freedom, talks about uh, that painting and the significance of uh, that really in, in, in world history. Yeah, that's amazing. Tell us about the, some of the statues, um, but not even of people, like the statues of liberty and all these other ideals and the symbols there. Sure, on the, on the uh, Capitol uh, dome, uh, right above the rotunda is the uh, statue of, of uh, liberty, the statue of freedom. And um, it was placed there by a slave. Philip Reed was a slave. He was purchased um, by a a foundry owner in South Carolina, brought to Washington, D.C., worked in the foundry and was such an exceptional worker that the owner of the foundry put him in charge of the project that placed the uh, Statue of Freedom on top of the dome of the Capitol. And uh, he actually got his uh, emancipation or his freedom as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, for the District of Columbia in 1863 and in 1864 placed that there. And I just think about what a great symbol, what a great story about how far America has come from this ugly, ugly part of our of our history to today. We still have plenty of room to 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 grow. But uh, just taking people out and pointing up to that and telling the story of uh, the, the slave that put the, the Statue of Freedom on the dome is, is just a great, a great example of right. where we are. Even he was building statues, and now here we are, people tearing them down with much less grievance than Philip Reed certainly had. Do, yeah. how, much do you know about him, how much do you know about him as a man? Was he... I mean, I, I'm assuming he wasn't like a bitter, angry person if he partook in this project. No, I, everything, every indication I have from what I've read is that that he was really an exceptional person. He he got his freedom, uh, and he got uh, paid for his work uh, after that. He actually got paid. Interestingly, uh, he got paid for his work on Sundays so that he would have spending money. But the other uh, six days of the week, uh, he was a slave, and when he was freed. Uh, he continued working at the same foundry, continued uh, being a leader at that foundry, wow. um, and uh, and uh, got paid for uh, every day of, of his work then. So you're clearly a storyteller, right, if you're giving tours all the time. 
someone called in my radio show the other day and, and said, Slater, how do we beat back this Marxist um, ideology of oppressed versus oppressor and all this other stuff? And I said, we got to tell better stories. And you're full of them. So I just want to ask you for one last like, great story like that, because I'm getting fired up just hearing this stuff. But also, can you speak to the importance of story? Because we're not telling many right now, or at least other people are telling different stories. So one of the great um, uh, statues that's in the uh, rotunda is the statue of Ronald Reagan. And in the statue of Ronald Reagan is uh, a layer um, that, that's very rough. You run your hand against it, and it's just this rough layer in between the, the statue and, and the pedestal. And that uh, layer is actually um, broken pieces of the Berlin Wall that was placed in uh, Ronald Reagan's statue so that people would recognize uh, the significance of Ronald Reagan in freeing tens of millions of people in the world from communism, from, uh, from oppression, from the Soviet Union and, and that dominance. And uh, again, you, you know, everything in this United States Capitol just speaks to freedom. And I, I think it's so important that we tell a story at each point. You know, I, I told people about uh, the significance of the number 13, 13 stripes in the flag and 13 statues for the original colonies in the, in the crypt. And uh, they're, they're just, uh, you know, e pluribus unum all over the United States Capitol. And, and each of these symbols uh, there is a great story behind it. And uh, if we don't tell, if we don't communicate in the form of stories, we don't, people don't remember what we're saying. If you go back in history, uh, there were no written records. Uh, people communicated from one generation to another by telling stories. And it's the way the human mind was created to remember. Yes, and if we're not telling them, then someone else is. And that's why you get the 1619 Project, among other things, just as an example. Congressman, I'm grateful for you putting this down to, to paper. Um, so hopefully we can read it and then share stories with our kids and grandkids. Capital of Freedom, Restoring America's Greatness. Congressman Ken Buck. Congressman, appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Good stuff. Ali Beth Stuckley. Stucky. She's got a book, too. Talk about that coming up next. Spread the word. Hey, Slider Crusaders. So, you know, one of the uh, themes of the show is perhaps the opposite is true. So you hear these things over and over in our society. We just, people lazily say them, and, and they're just in our culture, cultural soup. And it's worth taking a second to be like, wait a second. <laughs> perhaps the opposite of that thing is true. And I so value people who take the time to question these things and just to stop against the cultural tsunami that we're just deluged with all the time. And be like, wait a second, that's, that's not right. <laughs> And Ali Beth Stuckey has done that. Uh, she's the host of the Relatable podcast on Blaze Media, and her new book is You're Not Enough, and That's Okay. Awesome. Ali Beth, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Really good to talk to you. So let's just take real quick, what was the genesis of this book? Well, I love how you described it, actually. It wasn't hearing this phrase over and over again, that you are enough, and then other platitudes that go along with it. You have to love yourself before you can love other people. You're perfect the way you are. You determine your own truth. I started seeing these uh, phrases being tossed around, not just in the secular world, but also within the church, within places like women's ministries. And I started to ask myself, is this really true? It sounds good. It even feels good if you're dealing with insecurities or inadequacy or something like that. But is it really true? And then I started to ask the people who listen to my podcast and I started to get story after story of young women and especially young moms saying, look, I bought into this lie. I told myself that I'm enough, that I'm perfect the way I am. I followed the self-love gurus, the self-help experts, the mommy bloggers who all told me that the most important thing in my life is that I just feel good about myself. And why am I still miserable? Why do I still hate myself? Why is this not working? Why am I still depressed? I've been loving myself and engaging in self-care for so long now, and I am even more miserable and disappointed than I was before. And so I realized that this is simply a lie. This you are enough mantra is a lie that is leading women to a dead end because very simply the self can't be both the problem and the solution. 
if inside yourself you're dealing with those feelings of insecurity and inadequacy and deficiency, which we all do, self-loathing, the answer to those things is not going to be more you. It's not going to be found inside of yourself. It takes attaching yourself to something bigger than you. And that's what this book is about. Didn't it, like when you were writing this, like, wasn't it, didn't it feel so good when you knew you were onto something? <laughs> right? I mean, like what you just said is so perfectly true. Like, if, like, I love that you touched on, like, all those things. Like, so when you were writing this, weren't you like, oh, yes, finally. You know, it's hard to feel that sometimes when you're in the weeds, when you're or when you're in the moment working through this stuff, you ask yourself, even though you know that it's mm. true, you know, I'm a Christian, so I knew what I was saying was true biblically. I knew according to other people's experiences and my own experiences with attempting self-discovery and self-love when I was in college, um, I, I knew that what I was saying is true, but there are so many moments of doubt where you ask yourself, is anyone going to believe this? Like, this is such a popular lie and it feels so good to believe that we are all we need for our own happiness and purpose and truth and all of that. And we have so many people telling us that that's the case. Is anyone going to believe me? So I did my best to make the case. I go through five myths in the book that are culturally very popular. I talk about how they manifest themselves, why they're dangerous, and then I try to replace them with truth. So let's just hope that it hits home for people. Yeah. That's so good. All right, let's knock out one of them here. And then I got some other big questions. Um, let's, mm, well, this, this, all right, let's do this one quick. And we'll do another one here that I don't fully understand, but you're perfect the way you are. That's such a easy thing to say, and everyone's heard it a million times. You're perfect just the way you are. Uh, what do you say to that myth? Yes, so this is something that is so well intended for especially women who deal with any kind of insecurity. When we hear you're perfect the way you are, it's very similar to you're enough. What people are trying to say is that you don't need to wallow in self-pity, which I absolutely agree with. The reason I push back on that is not because I want people to bask in their imperfections and hate themselves. It's because your confidence can't be placed on an idea of your perfection or else that confidence is going to waver. So this is why self-love and self-sufficiency is not a good basis for uh, how you see yourself because it's ever-changing. We all know that we're not perfect. We're flawed. We're finite. We mess up. We come up short. There are a million times a day where we realize that we are not perfect the way we are. So why are we trying to convince ourselves that we are? It's exhausting. And the paradox comes in when you read a lot of these self-help and self-love gurus who tell you you're perfect the way you are, you're awesome and wonderful the way you are, but you'll really be perfect when you read my book or when you follow my 10-step program or when you do my exercise routine or whatever it is. And so people are using you're perfect the way you are as kind of a Trojan horse for more legalism. <laughs> and um, it's just a burden that we don't have to bear. We were not meant to be perfect and we don't have to convince ourselves that we are to be joyful and fulfilled people. Yeah, so you, you maybe touched on this a bit. Do you, did you find in your research here that the people who came up with these initial myths, right, do you think they were well-intentioned? The, the initial people, right? Not like people now are well-intentioned for the most part. But do you think the people who initially came up with these were well-intentioned? Or is it like a, like a intentional, like feminist lie or a postmodern Marxist lie to get people to think a certain way? What's your take on that? Right. I do think that originally it was well intended. I mean, this has been popular in psychology for decades. And when I was researching, I was surprised to find books talking about this stuff in the 1970s. I mean, we have been yeah. told by psychologists, by social scientists for years that low self-esteem is a reason for society's problems, that if we just had high self-esteem, we wouldn't have crime. We wouldn't have academic failure. Everyone would just be happier and better and everyone would pursue their dreams. Despite the fact that there's study after study proving that that's not true, that self-esteem is not the core problem that people are dealing with. And actually there's really not a self-love deficit in this country. Whether people struggle with self-loathing or arrogance, they're both signs of self-obsession. What I argue is that we just need to get out of ourselves, stop obsessing over what we think of us. All right, Han, that line was really good. Whether it's self-loathing or self-obsession, the self is the problem. <laughs> uh, right. don't, so I'm a Christian. Don't be afraid to, to throw some Jesus in here because that's ultimately the answer, right? So yes. you get and rid of the self and then what? 
Yes, that is the, the core of this book. So the reason why uh, we can't focus on ourselves, for our confidence, for our satisfaction, and for our truth, I had a good friend on my podcast say, uh, the self makes a terrible God because you can't tell yourself anything you don't already know. And that's essentially what this self-love culture is doing. It is trying to make you your own God. You determine your own truth. You're entitled to everything you want. You sacrifice everything on the altar of your convenience or the altar of what feels good for you. And that is what we're told by our cultural betters that um, that is what is going to make us happy and allow us to do all the things that we need to do. But as we have already established, the self can't be both the problem and the solution. We are so incredibly finite and it is such a burden to have to be our own sufficiency and to be our own determiners of truth and to try to pretend like we're perfect. And so the good news comes in the fact that we don't have to worry what we think of us which is so changing depending on our circumstances and what other people say about us, we get to take our eyes off of our imperfect selves, our insufficient selves, and put them on God who doesn't change. The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if we're wondering what our value is, if we want to know who we are, where we came from, our purpose, if we want to be satisfied, which is really what all of us want, then we need to look to the God who created us. And if we're wondering what we're worth, we can look to the cross of Jesus Christ. He sent his son to die for us, to reconcile us to him. That is where we find our value. That is where we find our identity. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people read this title and they think that I'm encouraging people to hate themselves. And I think that we yeah. have to escape that false binary of either we're telling ourselves how awesome we are or we're telling ourselves how terrible we are. Of course, we don't want to tell ourselves how terrible we are. What I'm encouraging is to get out of that binary altogether. Stop thinking about what you think of you constantly. Stop taking all the personality tests. Stop uh, analyzing yourself constantly and worrying about your level of self-esteem. Take your eyes off of yourself and what you think of you. Put your eyes on God, on who he is, what he's done for you, and who he says you are as a believer. I'm so grateful. You, we just did a segment on moral courage. I'm so grateful you have the moral courage to give the answer to it all as well. You could have just left it at, you know, don't. Don't focus on the self so much, right? And maybe like go volunteer your time at a local charity, and like that's good, but that's not really the answer. And so I'm, I'm grateful you did that. Um, we got a couple minutes here. I want to ask you about. Uh, you've been on a bunch of different podcasts. I've seen you all over, and I'm grateful for that too. Um, what have you noticed about being on? Like we're on the same page, Ali. Like conservative, Christian, young, right? Like we're we're simpatico. Have you been anywhere and talked to people who are maybe not Christian or not conservative? And what have you noticed with this message and just talking to people outside of our bubble. You know, it's funny what you just said is that I, we could have left it off and a lot of people do. There is a lot of pragmatism. There's a lot of practical um, use in just being a selfless person and saying, you know, it makes you happier. It makes you more joyful. If you get married, if you have kids, if you're patriotic, if you're involved in your community and, and things like that, I could have left it vague, but um, when you don't address the spiritual, the eternal side of it, uh, then everything just seems kind of fleeting and superficial if uh, that's kind of the advice that I'm giving. And yet I've had a lot of podcast hosts, which is fine to ask this, but I get this question so much is, um, well, what do you tell people who don't want to believe what you believe? Is that really the only answer? Is Christianity only the, the only answer? What about people who don't believe? What about the people who don't have faith? Can they still get something out of this book? Can they still get some practical um, you know, tips? Which, yes, like I said, of course you can. And of course, I want people who aren't believers to read this book. But if you are not if, if you are not interested in hearing the gospel uh, chapter after chapter, page after page, then you might be kind of perturbed by this book because I so <laughs> strongly believe and know that that is the answer. Like there's a reason why Jesus calls himself living water and bread of life because he satisfies. And so I can tell you all the things that you can do to probably be happier in this life. I do think that you should get married and have kids and work hard at your job, whether or not it's your dream job. I do think that you should care about things that are bigger than you. I do think that you should volunteer. There are lots of things that I think you should do that the world is telling you not to do that don't necessarily feel good in the moment, but are good for you and other people around you. But ultimately, if you are not looking to the God who created you to define who you are and tell you what you're worth, you are going to keep on going on this cycle of trying to prove to yourself that you are enough, that you don't need faith, that you don't need God. And it's 
going to end up exhausting you and unfortunately has eternal implications as well. 30 seconds. Uh, what myth of yours or thing you've said on maybe the secular shows um, gets the most pushback? It all gets pushed back. Actually, Christian and secular shows, people are very kind of confused about, okay, why? what's wrong with self-love? Doesn't Jesus say to love our neighbor as we love ourselves? And my answer to that is always, um, Jesus is assuming that we love ourselves in the sense that we are always seeking our own interests, not necessarily that we're affectionate towards ourselves. Um, and that is the love that he is calling us to love other people with. And it's his love that compels us to do that, not superficial and ever-changing self-love. And Jesus didn't go get a rest by going to the spa. He went right. to go get rest to pray. Um, right. All right, the book, You Are Not Enough and That's Okay. It's Allie Beth Stuckey. And you should go buy it right now. And you should listen to her podcast. It's relatable on uh, Blaze Media. Ali Beth, uh, you're awesome. You have an awesome message here. And I'm glad you're out there getting it out there. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, ma'am. Have a superb day. True story. Mike Slater. Uh, we got our big special tomorrow. Spread the word.